because I didn't want to face all of you by myself, I brought along uh, some long-standing members of my crew. To my immediate right is, and you and I were trying to figure out, I think I've known you for 30 years, Nancy Silverton, you all know, winner of multiple James Beard Awards, best restaurant, best pastry chef, best chef in America, member of Who's Who, uh, written more books. In fact, you know what book I still cook from is Two Chefs Cook at Home, wow. which is an awesome book, probably out of print, yes. but we still <laughs> use it. <laughs> it's really great. So Nancy is here to, uh, to tell some stories about me. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, to her right is my friend and collaborator and crew member for what, about 10 years now, I guess, Kenji Lopez-Alt. Uh, the author of Food Lab, also a James Beard cookbook winner. Uh, you know, it's like Kenji's just one of those guys you walk into a, a restaurant and they're like, with, and if we go in together, it's like, who's the guy with Kenji? <laughs> so here we are together <laughs> and um, and Kenji obviously plays a big role in Serious Eater, uh, a really important role, and we've been friends and colleagues for a long time, and, and uh, I'm happy to say that we're, our, our friendship has endured, and we're always talking and texting and doing things that friends do together. So anyway, it's great to have him here. And we're just going to have a free-flowing conversation. You're probably going to, we're probably going to enter into TMI mode, but we'll <laughs> let you all say that. Uh, and we're, we'll go from there. Yeah. Um, so first, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to say, um, you sent me the, script, the, the book, uh, I guess, like six, six months, months or ago, so ago, probably. which was um, an early draft, so not quite finished yeah. yet. Um, um, and I mean, I, I, knew, I knew it was going to be good. Um, because you, you do good, good stuff. Um, but um, no, I was surprised how exciting it was, like how it's like uh, um, an actual story. It's not, it's not just a series, you know, memoirs can often just be a series of anecdotes, but this was like an actual story with, with themes and, uh, you know, plot, plot structure um, that somehow got magically built into it. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, I guess, why, um, why Serious Eater and why now? You know, it's a, it's a great question. It's something I still think about. You know, it, Serious Eats was such an insane roller coaster ride, as you all are about to read. Um, and it really tested me in ways I had no idea I would be tested. You know, uh, it's weird having your brother who became your legal guardian be the biggest investor in Serious Eats. By the way, do not try this at home. Very, very, very bad idea. Uh, but we survived. And, um, and I was just incredibly proud of what we had done, you know, and, and, and the crew we had built. And, uh, you know, one of the greatest pleasures was watching Kenji and everybody else take flight. It was the, one of the most unexpected pleasures. And I just wanted to, to connect the dots for myself. And, and the weird and surprising thing was that it turned into a pretty good book. Uh, you know, I went from, I just hope this doesn't suck to, wow, this is a pretty good book, and it's a good story. And I remember <laughs> when I first signed the contract, I thought it was going to be a prescriptive business memoir. Yeah. And then I realized, that's a joke. <laughs> and this woman that I call my, my book therapist, who my wife, who was here tonight, and uh, you know, uh, as she said to my sister-in-law, we come off like saints in this book. And you know, that's because they, what I put her through and a lot of people through to keep Serious Eats alive is not something I would ever recommend to anybody else. Uh, but, um, 
and she is, you know, Serena Seeds became a love story. I didn't know it would be a love story. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a love story about my wife, about my brother, um, about my son who is here tonight. And, and so I just thought if I could share my experiences that some people would benefit. And mm -hmm. you, it's, it, you know, I think one of the things that people might be surprised about is it's not really a food book. It's not my search for the best pizza or the best hamburger or the best hot dog, which is what a lot of people know me for. And I'm very proud of that work. <laughs> it, it, it's a book about humanity. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's a book that I think everybody can relate to. And, I, and I'm happy, I'm thrilled that, that it's resonated with so many people. You know? I mean, it, it is also a food book, though, right? Yeah, because for sure. Because I was talking with, with Zach, Zach Yeah, Brooks yeah, earlier. our friend Zach Brooks is here, who runs Smorgasburg LA, uh, and worked briefly, he says, so briefly that he didn't get a mention in the book. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> Zach uh, said, after he read the book, he read it on a transcontinental plane, he said, why is it that you think that every meeting you would be best served by bringing food. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's so. I mean that's what we were joking about was that the whole book is essentially just a series of meetings. Um, but but you do remember exactly what food you brought to every one of those. Meetings. <laughs> yes, it's true. My wife, you know, says when if you ask her what she had for dinner yesterday, someone asked her backstage. She's like, I don't know. And then she goes, Why do I need to waste the space on my hard drive? I've got Ed. <laughs> you know, so, um, and so, yeah, it, food is a metaphor, you know, and food is, a, is an instrument that I try to use to bludgeon people into giving me money. Uh, it's, a, it's also a good bar barometer, right? Yeah. Because like, I, I noticed when I was trying to get into the writing world that the most, you know, like 90% of the meetings I had with people who were supposed to be editors, like leaders in the writing world, were... Um, they, they didn't actually seem to care about what they were eating. Like, you know, like it, 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 was, it was always business first and then less about the food. Um, and then I had a meeting with you and we went, um, we met at a burger place <laughs> oh, and I was so like, I, I was a little shy and I was like, I don't, I'm not sure what to order. Like what, what's, what'll make me look smart to order? Um, and then Ed just calls the waiter over and orders half the menu. And I was like, that's Which the guy. Which is kind of a usual <laughs> state of affairs. Yeah. Nancy, and how, did, how did you meet Ed? Well, you know, Ed uh, showed up at uh, my uh, then restaurant, Campanile. Uh, what year would that God, be? it had to be in, Vicky would know. What year was I working on Northwest Airlines food? Uh, early 90s. Early okay, 90s, early like 90s, 90, so. probably 93, 94. Okay, so Campanile opened uh, in 1989, and, uh, and it was in the, I think it was in the day that, that Ed popped up and he managed to locate someone that looked like a manager and he said I'd like to meet the chefs of the restaurant and <laughs> so I was dragged out and there was Ed Levine and he said I I have an idea you know I'm trying to put together a team of cooks from around the United States to cook airplane food and that's <laughs> all he had to say was true story right I want to make airplane food better. And that was before any airline. I think maybe American had a team. Of yes, the American had that original but team with Wolfgang and, yeah. That, that whole that group was of it. people. But that was it. Um, uh, today, you know, we love to see all the famous uh, chefs that are, that design collaborate menus, and yeah. design menus at all the airlines. But Ed came up with this idea. And uh, it took no convincing. No, you when were like, you I you said, no, I, I'm in. I mean, the idea of the challenge, it was a challenge that airplane food could actually be edible. Right. And you asked me what was really interesting was, what are the <laughs> you asked me, like, will we work on coach? And I was Which like. Which is all I flew in those right. days. Right. So and so I was, was like, if I selfish. tell her yes, is that going to scare her <laughs> away? And she and I was like, well, yes, I need you to work on coach. And she said, good, because that's all I fly. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, what are, what are the challenges of designing airplane food? Oh, there is a multitude of yeah. challenges. First of all, somebody using your recipe. Right. right. Secondly, 
the ingredients they buy, how they execute it, right? How they heat it up. That was a how huge shell. Well, in the little ovens, right? On and the plane. Right, yeah, and, and the ovens are often miscalibrated by 50 degrees. And yeah. it has to arrive. Too, it has yeah. to arrive at a certain temperature. And there were, um, there was. I mean, I remember some of the, um, some of the the sort of rules that we were uh, brought through. Like, for instance, no beans at that time could be on right. the plane for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons. Right? <laughs> uh, no beans on no beans, airplane food. No beans. <laughs> Uh, it's like, oh, wow, because, you know, beans are cheap, and there's great ways of using beans, but we couldn't use beans. At that time, we couldn't make soup, right? Um, but on and on and on. But there's certain, you know, I mean, you can make that small dish that you think was going to be delicious. Right. And then you present it, and then you taste it after it's been made in a catering kitchen. Right, right, and right. So, you know, or even most in your of own the time, kitchen. it's not recognizable. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, and so them. it's weird. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about when I knew the three of us, were, you know, the, that I think we have in common, you know, is I, I kept, when I, when I started Serious Seats, uh, there was no model, you know, like there was no, like, this is the roadmap. And I was thinking about the two of you, and, and in a way that was terrifying, and in a way it was emancipating, right? So. I knew I couldn't take any missteps that w that other people had set out for me. Of course, I I had no idea how difficult it was going to be to to make the business work. But in a way, I was starting to think about the two of you, and that you know when I walked into the La Brea Bakery, I don't know if you remember, I had one of everything. I still had red hair, um, <laughs> but I literally was like, and then I was like, holy mackerel, like you know. This woman is making incredible bread and incredible pastries and incredible cookies. And when you started La Brea Bakery, it wasn't like LA was full of artisanal bakeries, you know, and, and full of artisanal bread bakeries. And, and the same thing, uh, so I'd love to hear from you and also from Kenji, it's, it's really the same question, you know, it's like, Food Lab just seemed to emerge from your, you know, from just like in full flight from the moment you started, you wrote that first column for us. Mm -hmm. And and I couldn't see any antecedent. Like, is it hard? You know, did you, or did you just like, this is just what we do? Like, did you think about that? It was like, I'm sure you needed to write a business plan, and but were you really aware of what you were getting yourself into? I don't think we ever are. I mean, you certainly weren't, you know, right? You didn't realize what you were getting into. You, you <laughs> That's had a safe dream. bet. I thought, you know, I think, you know, I'm opening up this restaurant, and I think it'd be a nice, I think it'd be nice to have good bread. I think I'm going to build a bakery, right? And that was really kind of the way La Brea Bakery came about which ended up being a much more successful uh, arm of the business, right? right? I mean, but it was funny, years to come, um, reading about all of these concepts of, I'm gonna open a bakery cafe. It's like, wow, you know, I never thought of it as opening a bakery cafe. I thought about uh, building a place to make good bread for a restaurant and serving a little food with it and it became such a phenomenon and I think continues to become yeah. a phenomenon, right? Even after you've sold it. Well, yeah, but just that kind of concept. Yes, for sure. Food oh yeah, the bakery, bakery cafe, yeah. Look at in those days, you know, I'm, I'm looking out, I don't know if every, anyone was alive in those days, but <laughs> we're talking 1989. When somebody thought about a bakery, they thought about, first of all, sweets. They didn't think about bread. But if they were going to think about it in, in, at all, they would think about it as, in Los Angeles, a Jewish bakery. I'm going to mm -hmm. go to a bakery, I'm going to buy a cake. Where are you going to go? You're going to go in Fairfax, or you're going to buy a loaf of bread and, and a cake. That was it. And so opening up a bakery that only sold bread, which it did at the beginning. You came a, a little bit after that when right. we actually started making um, cookies some, other, and, you know, yeah, some other things. But at the beginning, it was solely bread. And people would walk in, and they would say, 
where's the cakes? <laughs> it's like, we don't do cakes, you know? <laughs> so they didn't really, that, the idea of a bakery was not a bread bakery. And I have How to long did it take to get adopted? Uh, it, it, it took a little bit, but not as long as, as you would think. I mean, mm. the first uh, people that would walk in were very, very confused. They would look at the loaves and they would say they were burnt. They would look at the loaves <laughs> and they would say they were dirty because there was flour that, you know, yeah, encrusted yeah. the loaves. They would walk in and they would say, I bought your bread, it was too holy, the <laughs> peanut butter or my tuna <laughs> fell through it. But we went through those people and then we did get uh, a lot of people that uh, became uh, customers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about you, Kenji, in terms of like, uh, I know you've said, like, it wasn't like you, you, you decided from a very young age you were going to do a food lab, you were going to devote right. a <laughs> lot of your writing to food science. You know, like, how did that come about? And did it worry you that there, I mean, there were some antecedents. There were some people mm -hmm. like Harold McGee oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alton and, and Alton Brown and Shirley, Shirley Corver. Yes. Um, but, I mean, I, I don't even know why I asked you, Frank. It's just like, this dude went to MIT. He must be interested in science. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, well, I, I mean, I consider myself I mean, extremely lucky how my career has turned out um, because, I mean, my... I figured out early, pretty early on, like basically in high school, that like I was really good at things I was interested in, and very poor at things. Oh yes, like, your, you mother, know, a, a your mother told me to told myself, us applying that. myself to things unless I'm really excited by them. Um, and so, I mean, basically every decision, career decision I made has basically been, you know, it's like which which path looks more exciting to drive down, and that's it. Um, and then, um, yeah, you know, so so that that's what made me first, I guess, become a cook. After you know, like, I, I started cooking one summer. Um, while I was in college. Just and I know that your mother was thrilled about your okay. career. <laughs> right, what did she, she say to you? She told me I might as well get a job at McDonald's. <laughs> um, not that where I was working was much better than McDonald's, but it was, it was a summer job. I was actually looking for a job as a server, and just luckily the restaurant like that day had a prep cook that didn't show up, and they said if I can come to work today, that day at 4 p.m., I could have a job for the summer. So I was like, all right, I'll try that. Um, and he learned all these tricks from Mongolian grills, yes, right? Yes, I was. A, you I could was do a, that. I was a knight of the round grill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, I got my promotion w was from prep cook to knight of the round grill, which is a pretty big, uh, <laughs> pretty big leap. Um, um, you know, and then eventually, it, I, I worked in restaurants basically steadily after that. Um, and um, and for me, I guess um, just because I had. Um, a, you know, strong education science. Um, I was always, you know, I always wondered about why we were doing things. Yeah, we doing and you once told me that, uh, and Kenji's dad uh, is a professor at Harvard Medical School, and you said that you always, one of the things that you, that you um, couldn't figure out was why they would spend so much time on one experiment and only to see it fail. And that yeah. one of the reasons <laughs> you loved food experimenting Right. was you Immediate saw feedback. the results in a day or an hour. Yeah, or as, I mean, as soon as someone eats it, you see the results. Right. So there's like a real quick feedback loop, especially in restaurants. Um, less, slower in recipe writing, but I think maybe a little more satisfying for me. Um, but yeah, you know, so I, I, I started having all these questions that I wanted answered, and then I saw an ad for a test cook position at Cook's Illustrated, um, and I was like, that seems like the kind of place where I can apply my skills and get some of my questions answered. Um, yeah. And then yeah, it's all it's all just, and then like luckily I met you and <laughs> um, you know and that turned out to be the thing that was right for my career because um, you know I loved working at Cooks Illustrated, um, but they have um, a, a very a Cooks Illustrated style like their editorial the themes, voice like a, a sausage grinder or whatever goes into it is just Cooks Illustrated sausage at the end, um, and so you don't get much of a voice and um, yeah and then and then I saw Serious Eats like I think I saw some stuff by Adam. Um, and, and Robin, and you know, and, and Serious Eats is the kind of site um, where you could go on and just within the first three sentences, you know who's writing it. Yeah. You know, like it felt like a, like it felt like a family. Um, and so that's, that's what it sort of attracted me to, to that. Um, yeah, and it really was, you know, I mean, it was my attempt to, you know, my parents died when I was a teenager, and, and it's interesting that you said that because, and it's, it's, I talk about this in the book that I really was trying to recreate a family, you know, mm -hmm. at Serious Eats, and 
I think this probably takes place also at restaurants when you, oh, yes. you know, when you guys uh, have restaurants and, and uh, that's why I was always so crushed when anybody would leave. Like people stayed at oh, Surrey Seats. I was really actually going to, I was going to read something that you wrote. Uh oh. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, because because I don't know if you knew this, but like when, in some of those middle years, like a little after I joined, and like we had like a really tight crew. Um, um, I don't even know this, but like uh, people would call you Uncle Ed. Um, <laughs> And so it always felt, you know, it always felt like a family there. And so, um, yeah, so you, later, towards the end of the book, you say, um, uh, after, after Serious Seats was sold and things started changing, uh, my fears about people leaving Serious Seats and feeling abandoned when they did were once again haunting me. A few people did leave, so my worst fears were being realized. The Fexy folks expected this to happen. I should have as well, but I didn't. I, des I desperately needed the family to stay together. Every time someone left, it felt like a death in the family. Um, so I guess... Yeah, I guess what I wanted to ask you was like, how do you think that relationship that you had with your staff, um, like what, what do you think are the most positive things that came out of that? And then also sure. what do you think are the most yeah, negative yeah. things? I mean, I think the positive thing was I truly cared about each and every person. I mean, it was a small crew, as you know, and they all um, shared my values. You know, it's like, one of the things people say, that, you know, like a, a current editor, Show Spade at the series, he said, I don't understand, like, you got lucky with Kenji once, and then you got lucky again with Stella, you know, and, and I said, it's, in a way, it's, it's not luck, because what I look for in family members and series Eats crew members were people who shared my values, and once they shared my values and then I would just turn them loose, you know, and, but the downside of that is they're not your family, you know, they're, people have families, you know, and I had a family too, and especially when I met Vicky and fell in love with her, and then we had Will, I had a family, but I still hadn't, I don't think I'd sufficiently recovered from losing my parents. My dad died when I was 12, and then my mom died when I was 15. So I was sort of, uh, I was still trying to, to it was like a, a, a piece of pottery that had broken. I was trying to sort of put it back together, even though you can't really put back a, a, a piece of pottery together. So, you know, it was, and by the way, it also meant, and this is a downside, right, that I was really trusting. And uh, you'll read in the book, um, the first Serious Seats crew I put together were not, did not have my best interests at heart. And um, I eventually had to part ways. And it almost, you know, it almost brought the site down right after it started. And so, uh, you know, I got, I hope I got a little smarter in terms of hiring people, but I never sort of lost that. And I, you know, people would stay at Serious Seats. I don't know, Ken, Kenji, you know, he, he rode and ran. He only stayed for like seven years, you know. <laughs> so, so, but like people stayed for a long time. Yeah. And I tried to create um, not only a family, but a place where people could do their best work. I, I, I was, I was, first of all, I was a terrible employee. Can I say that? I, <laughs> I was going to say they, they, people, people stayed for so long because for most of them it was, it was their first job and they didn't really realize that they're never going to find anything better. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but it's, it's true. And, I, and, I, and because I was such a terrible employee, my son who's here tells me I have the worst poker face in the world, <laughs> uh, which I do. And Kenji, always, Kenji says, you know, in the forward, it's like we could always tell when something bad happened. Yeah, like, if, you, if you did a graph of like the height of Ed's shoulders <laughs> as you walked through the door this morning, it would like exactly match how, uh, how much in the red series was <laughs> in that day. It's true. But, but um, you know, I... Uh, it just mattered to me so much that people could spend their 90% of their time on the work and 10% about the other things. And I figured if I did that and if I 
spotted talent well, not that I, you know, Kenji, I was overpaying him. I think I was paying him $25 a story when I first uh, hired him. Uh, but, you know, I didn't have money to throw at people, so I had to create an atmosphere where people wanted to come to. I wanted them to look forward to coming to work. And so, um, but, you know, it did reach a point where uh, it was unhealthy, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's not that it, it wasn't ever to the detriment of the site. It was just a detriment to my emotional and psychological well-being more than anything else. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's it is, and I'm sure you two both have similar stories about rest, you know, uh, sort of pseudo families in kitchens in mm -hmm. in places you've worked. But that's just how I roll. Then you know, I truly, truly. Uh, loved the people that I hired, you know, whether it was Kenji or Adam Kuban or Elena. And these are all people, and, and, and here's one of the, the good things. They really did share the foxhole with me, you know, and Kenji, like if someone was leaving, you know, Kenji would just like, hey, we got to go have coffee because you know, we got to figure this out. But it wasn't like, you know, I ever worried that Kenji was going to leave, even though God knows you had a zillion opportunities to leave. And, you know, there's a story in the book uh, when there was one such offer and I'm like, you know, and I was paying Kenji, thir I didn't give him a raise, he was making $30 a story <laughs> by this time. And... He said, well, I've got this offer, and I'm like, you know, I totally understand. His wife was in graduate school. Uh, you know, he was making, <laughs> I think, to make money, you were making burritos for... For uh, burritos for, like, an Upper West Side For Upper West Side family. <laughs> and, um, but in a true act of loyalty, and I'm sure there are other reasons, but... He came back from the weekend. He said, you know, I'm going to stay. Because I said, you know, look, I can't hire you. I don't have the money, but I'll have it in three months. And um, so that's one of the upsides of, of treating people like family is that yeah. they respond in kind. I, yeah, I mean, I was going to say that you in the book, um, it, that theme comes up that, that your trustingness gets you into trouble. But I think, I mean, I think it's also your greatest strength because it, it, it you know, when, when you take a business meeting, when someone takes a business meeting with you, it's pretty easy to, to read you, you know, like, like you don't hide much. Um, <laughs> and so for, you know, I, I can see like how just like from a pure business standpoint that can turn, turn certain types of people off. Right. Um, a lot of types of people off. Yeah. Um, but the ones that it does attract, the ones like who are into people who are clearly you know, passionate about what they're working on, um, who are honest and who are going to, um, you know, treat you fairly and, and be upfront about everything like that. I think when you attract those kinds of people, you end up being yeah frequently the the right ones. Um, yeah, and we you have a good barometer for yeah. And we used to we'd go out all the time. Kenji introduced me to karaoke. An excellent karaoke singer, by the way, right there, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Kenji Lopez all. <laughs> uh, and I my jam, by the way, is um, Midnight Train to Georgia. Okay, so I'm not going to do it for you guys, uh, but Kenji actually has a good voice. In fact, recently, you you actually did a, a children's uh, album with a friend, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's just for my daughter, really, but <laughs> <laughs> it exists, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, but anyway. <laughs> um, Nancy, do you want to talk about your struggles? Yeah, like, you, you know, Where it's, do it's, I not start? Straight, it's not a straight, <laughs> it's not a straight line, line for any of us. In, nice what I'm interested in yes. is, um, did you have, when you started, um, first of all, assuming that you had some idea that you were actually starting a business and what that means and everything, did you have sort of an idea of what your values for running the business were going to be? Um, and was there any point where you had to come up with a tough decision and, and, and sacrifice any of those values? Did any of those values change over time? Um, 
Well, you know, as far as the tough decisions and uh, the sacrifices, it's when I learned that owning a restaurant was not a hobby but a business. And I think that really, really changed the way that uh, I thought about a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it was always I was going to do what I loved doing. I, I think that I opened up a restaurant pretty early in life. I was, I think, 32, something around that, which seems so young. I look at a lot of the cooks that work with me at the restaurant now, and I think, wow, what would you do if you had to actually assume all that responsibility? Because it's really a lot of responsibility. It's not only to the cooks that you work with, but it's also, in my case, the investors that invested with you, right? It's, yes, I'm it's, familiar with that. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know that. Um, but uh, I just really never thought of it as a business, and and that is the sacrifices that I had to make when I had to, um, you know, uh, make decisions about how much money people were going to be making, decisions about what kind of food and the cost of it and the cost of how it was going to be on the menu and try to be successful. And it was not something that I was really ever good at. Um, I think I grew up a lot when I ended up uh, working with uh, Joe Bastianich, who was really tough. And that's what I'm talking about when I left Campanile and started to work at Moza, where he was a real numbers cruncher. Mm -hmm. um, which I respect and I also fight about, but in the end, we've still we've been in business for you know 13 years now, which is. But that wasn't until you were takes. in your in your 40s, right? Well, let's see. I'm 65 Thursday. <laughs> so Happy birthday, Thank Nancy! You. Uh, but uh, yeah, it 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 Campanile when. When I, when I worked there, I constantly fought about why does it matter what the food cost was and mm -hmm. why, you know, I mean, all the things that keep you in business. Right. Um, but all those important, important things. But I've learned a lot and I've learned how to have a uh, nice meme, you know, and I, uh, yeah. and I respect that. And Kenji, so, you sort of had a similar um, experience, right, in, in, in Worstall. Yeah, yeah, it's been an interesting, uh, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, is it a hobby or a business? It's a business. Um, <laughs> it's a business that I'm trying to, you know, I, I, from the, the idea from the start was that I was going to sort of be a consulting chef. Um, and then, and then I realized, you know what, this is like sort of in my backyard. Um, and I really like the idea for the project. And I like, my, I like the partners. So like, maybe I'll make it a partnership. Um, and then like, I wrote something about it on Twitter. Um, and then Ida wrote a story, and now suddenly it's like not, it's not just like a beer hall that serves sausage. It's like, oh, Kenji's opening up a restaurant in San Mateo. Um, and so, you know, that got me way more involved than yeah. I thought I would have to be, um, which is okay at the start. Um, um, you know, it put a big strain on my family, um, especially because I had, um, my daughter was like a year old um, when that started happening. And then, um, um, so, you know, it's sort of been a, a steady process of trying to get the restaurant to the point where um, it can manage itself without my daily, uh, you know, presence required. I mean, I, actually, I was, not, I was away for 90 days, so, and, and the restaurant is fine. Um, so, <laughs> um, I actually wanted to ask you a more, a more specific question, um, mainly for my own interest. Um, when you're developing a recipe for one of your restaurants, um, so my process is I'll, I'll, I'll think of a concept that I like, um, figure out sort of the, how I'm going to do it in the ideal way. Um, and then from there, I'll figure out, okay, like what is the cost of all, all what, what's the cost of the produce? Like when can I get the produce? Um, and then, so we sort of edit, edit the recipe down then, and then, then think about um, labor time involved, edit it down again. And then finally think about like the possibility, like the very large possibility for human error on the line and try and make the recipe as foolproof as possible. So it's like it's sort of, the dish that actually ends up on the plate is Pretty far from like what I it's initially. It's almost reverse thought. engineering. Yeah, I'm wondering. Yeah, and I, and you know, and I'm I'm no Nancy Silverton, um, <laughs> and my cooks are no Nancy Silverton cooks. Um, but but I wonder if you face like similar issues and what your process is, what your process is for specifically restaurant cooking. I think that my you know the the process you know usually starts with being inspired by either an ingredient or something that I just uh, tasted 
at uh, a farmer's market or somebody else's restaurant, and I become obsessed with that. And so I bring it into the restaurant, and I gather everybody around me, because I think at our restaurant, everything we do is a group effort, and I love that. There's, uh, besides all the wonderful things uh, about a restaurant, or the restaurant industry, such as an extended family, but is that collaborative, uh, the, the, the collaboration that we go through to bring a dish on the table. And it's very scrutinized, you know, it really is. Uh, um, uh, so I don't think necessarily uh, at the end about, uh, I don't think about the end game as like, can we really actually do it if mm -hmm. we're gonna do 350 people, you know, a night. Right. Um, because I think that the food that I do uh, never starts at a point that it can't be done because it's never finicky or right. manipulated, right, you right, know? Right, right, so right. it's just food. So, um, uh, uh, you know, so it, it is, it's that, that single ingredient or again, that, that flavor that I ate somewhere else or tasted mm -hmm. and we bring it in and um, I sort of look at where on the menu, what are we missing? Like, mm -hmm. do we need a salad today, right? Do I need a vegetable side today? Has the the uh, main courses are they are they getting kind of boring? Where, where do I need to 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 fit this into mm -hmm. to our menu? Um, and it sort of begins that way, and from there, everybody kind of puts in their input, their ideas. Uh, and I luckily get to judge get to see what makes it, <laughs> what makes the cut. Um, but it's always exciting, you know. I think that the one thing in a restaurant is that. It's difficult, you know, I think about the days of Chez Panisse where every single day there was a new menu, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, that is a lot of work because whenever I do something, I think about how I can do it better and how I would change it. And so it really needs to go through that process before it mm -hmm. makes it onto the menu. Um, but... Um, it's, it's funny you say that though because Ed, um, we were talking earlier today, and Ed says that he always describes you as having um, perfect food pitch, meaning that like you have, she you have very instant recognition of what is actually uh -oh. good and what's not. Yeah, because we were talking about because, uh, you know, I had a career in the music business, right? I ran a jazz club and produced some Dr. John records, all of which you'll read about in the book. But and and Kenji is is a musician and and it comes from a very musical family. I have a brother who's a conductor, and then I was thinking. Well, I don't really know much about Nancy's taste in music, but it was like I said to Kendi, but she does have perfect food pitch. <laughs> and it, and it, it, it's a true story. You know, you just, whenever we would go out to eat, which was a lot back in the day, you, you, you could like, isn't this hamburger perfect, Ed? Or don't you think it needs a little salt? Or, and it was just like you were always spot on. And uh, there are very few people like that. So like when you tackled pizza, like I knew it was going to be great pizza, and you know, and and it's it's one of the great things about you. So I know we have to. We're probably getting pretty close to the end. But one of the things I wanted to ask you guys both is because <laughs> I have many many regrets that <laughs> uh, I have uh, uh, that you'll all read about in the book. Uh, not that I would change anything, but, you know, um, talk about some of the, like, what, what, you know, and you, you have uh, wonderful children, uh, each of whom I know, and, and Kenji, uh, you know, has uh, a wonderful wife and gorgeous daughter, uh, but, you know, what we all do, um, it exacts a cost, right? And, like, do you have any regrets about about the paths that you've taken, you know, and and uh, it's a way of leading up to a section of the book that I'm going to read that's about some of the regrets that I've had, you know. So, but I'd love to know from from the two of you. Like, I don't know if this is a question you've pondered, but uh, you, Marie, you know, it's like. Like, is there ever anything you go, you know, I wish I didn't throw myself into this quite this mm -hmm. way? Because, you know, I've heard all these stories about you, like, bringing your infants 
to, you know, to the bakery while you're baking bread, you know, it's like... Well, I lived upstairs, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But, I mean, is there you know, anything... I've yeah. thought about it a lot because I think I could have been a better mother, meaning that... A better mother, whatever that means, does it mean spending, you know, more time or more quality time, and I spent as much time as I could, but I think that me as a person, and who chose to be a mother, by the way, um, was also so driven by what I was doing that I think I created the only balance that I created. So for instance, if I decided to take time off and say maybe I'm gonna take five years off and wait till my children are in school before I resume my career, I think I would have been a worse mother. So I just made it happen. I made it happen by, you know, sometimes not taking a shower for three days so I could be around, you know, uh, wearing the same, you know, flower uh, coated clothes and so not maybe being the most presentable mother, you know, um, <laughs> uh, in, in my children's peers, you know. But I feel like it was a challenge, but I feel like I made it work the way that I could make it work. And so I don't feel like I had yeah. any regrets. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Kenji? Um, I, I would say my... Because you're like, Nancy, you don't do things halfway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say my biggest regret, and I don't, and I don't mean to send any kind of like... Um, um, I, I don't mean to send any kind of like the, uh, the pejorative, the whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to put down um, my current project, worst all. Um, but, um, you know, as I, as, I, as I was talking about before, like, I, it, it kind of came as a surprise to me how much it would actually have to be involved. Um, and, um, you know, when, when my daughter was born was when I left Serious Eats. Um, and I think, I think I'd just been reading, like, a Reddit thread about Rick Moranis, who um, was, you know, like, recognizable yeah. you know, actor. Um, and uh, when his kid was born, he basically decided to quit his career and just focus on the kids. And so... You know, and so I was thinking to myself, you know what, like, I, had, I just had this successful book, and, like, um, and my wife, like, has a great career now, um, and we're planning on having a kid, so, like, why, you know, why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I, I I've never heard of anyone later in life saying, like, I regret spending more time with my kid. Yeah. Um, and so I decided to leave, um, basically, all the businesses um, behind and not really work and just focus on Alicia, but then um, this restaurant thing, which I thought was just going to be consulting, um, like, a year later, it turns out, no, it's, like, yeah, you got to be there, otherwise this is going to be terrible. Right. Um, and so for a good like three months or so, um, um, right around Alicia's first birthday, for a, good, for a good three months or so, I was basically there. Like I would take, I would take Alicia to daycare in the morning, um, spend the day at the restaurant, pick her up from daycare, bring her home, give her a bath, and then go back to the restaurant. Um, so I would see her, you know, a couple hours a day. Um, but that was that went on for three months and you know seven days a week. And um, so I guess. Yeah, I mean that, that was, was a, hard. Yeah, yeah, it was a huge regret, um, and it, you know, it had a huge strain on um, on our marriage, um, uh, because you know, also because I did, I did, I was so freaked out about the restaurant that I, um, like I, I, Alicia had been going to daycare two days a week before that, and I, I had her the other three days, um, and then when I saw I needed to spend more time at the restaurant, like I kind of called, I, I decided that it was going to be five days a week, and I forgot to <laughs> ask my wife about it. Um, <laughs> So I, I was very, you know, very rightfully like I, I, I did a lot of dumb things yeah. um, just because of the this, this stress and pressure that I, yeah. I was under. Um, so that, that would be my, yeah. my biggest so regret. And I think it comes from working in series. You know, it comes from spending like 10 years of my life just being able, like not having, you know, having responsibilities, but having um, a wife who was equally interested in her career. Yeah. Um, and so we both just worked a lot. And so we got used to that. And then kind of didn't realize it doesn't work when you have a kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So if you, hit me, if you give me the book, oh, yeah. I'm going to, uh, and then we're going to open this to questions, but I want to read you about my, see something about my regret, which was really, really uh, hard uh, when I saw, when I, you know, Serious Eats was a nine-year battle right, to, to bring it across the finish line. And, a nine-year um, overnight sensation. A nine-year overnight sensation. And so um, this is what I wrote. Oh, with the deal really done, I had to take stock of the collateral damage Series he had done to my relationships with both Vicky and Mike. That's my brother. 
the fight to keep Syria's seats alive had been a grueling nine-year battle, and like most battles, it had left some wounds that still hadn't healed. I mistakenly thought at the time that the proceeds of the sale would wipe away all of Vicky's conflicted feelings about the whole Syria's seat saga. The rewards were worth the risks, weren't they? But I couldn't wipe the slate clean. Why? Because when I learned about the relationship between risk and reward in business, no teacher at Columbia Business School spoke to the collateral, emotional, and psychological damage associated with the risks you take to reap the rewards. That damage, it turns out, is really difficult to repair. Vicki thought I didn't give credit where credit was due. She was wrong, maybe one of the only things she's been wrong about in 35 years of marriage. It was true that I couldn't entirely admit how instrumental she'd been, and it's true that I was too dumb to really give credit where it was due, but it's also true that I literally can't imagine what it would have been like to do this without her, and I am keenly aware that it wouldn't have worked if she hadn't been on my side. In fact, the most harrowing details I've had to relive in writing this book have nothing to do with financial security, only the terrifying knowledge of how close I came to doing real damage to the relationship that made it all possible. For the nine long years that it took the series to get series seats off the ground, in fact, long before that and after, I relied every single day on Vicky's solid judgment, her business savvy, her good counsel, her sense of humor, and her preternatural calm. Her unwavering belief in me was, and is humbling, I do not for a moment downplay the difficulty of the situations I put her in or the tremendous sacrifices she had to make. Which isn't to say that I was good at communicating any of this at the time. <laughs> so we kept fighting. More than a year after I sold the business, we had yet another argument that ended without a resolution, neither of us giving an inch. I got on my bike and rode to Tiffany. I'd never been inside <laughs> Tiffany, so I had no idea what to do when I went through the revolving doors. I asked the person stationed right inside the door where I could buy pearl earrings for my wife. Vicky had been talking about how much she wanted a pair of pearl earrings for years, even before Serious Seats. A kindly saleswoman showed me a variety of diamond and pearl earrings. I picked a pair out for Vicky. It's not a bad metaphor, a piece of grit in an oyster shell, a lot of work to make something that looks so effortlessly beautiful. She opened the box like a kid opening a present on Christmas morning. Vicky grinned from earring to earring as she walked over to a mirror to try them on. I almost started to cry, mostly out of frustration at myself. Why had it taken me so long to get to this place I obviously needed to be? Pride, stupidity, stubbornness, no matter. I made it. Let the healing begin. It continues to this day. Yeah. So anyway, we could talk for hours uh, and have a great time because uh, these are not people I get to see that often these days. But um, if you have any questions, uh, we're happy to answer them. Great. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, just a quick reminder around here, questions typically start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. They are generally short. We do not believe in two-part questions. <laughs> and tonight, only Nancy or Kenji get to ask follow-up questions. <laughs> Who would like to go first? If you could pick one food that typifies 2019, what would it be? One food that typifies 2019, what Combined. would it be? What's yours? Detroit pizza. Oh, wow. Yeah. Detroit pizza, have any of you everywhere. had? It's everywhere, it is. Yeah, Detroit pizza, is it, is it a thing in L.A. yet? I yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. What about you, Nancy? Wow. I'm stumped. <laughs> I don't ever you think You have that. to go out and smell the produce first. I have to go out and, <laughs> yeah, smell the produce. What do you say? I'll go third. You know, Detroit pizza is pretty good. And, and this is not something I necessarily think is a good idea, but like there are more poke uh, oh, wow. places That's so in New York. Like That's 2007. See, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, my. Yeah. Wow. Um, but, you know, Detroit pizza is, 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 is pretty good. I um, think anything cooked on a hearth. 
on a harp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, and the word that I can't get used to, by the way, and this is, two th well, this might be 2018. You're definitely 2019. 2018 is wood-fired cooking. Or, no, no, sorry, live fire. What does that mm -hmm. mean? Live fire. Live fire. Yeah. That's yeah. the weirdest, but what is live fire as opposed to? <laughs> <laughs> just pictures of fire near the. <laughs> is that not live? I mean, that's such a, like, oh, I, you keep reading about people that are opening live fire restaurants. Yeah. It's like true. the caveman for did it how many years ago? I think in like the early 2000s, for a while, fire roasted was the... Right, was the, fire um, roasted yeah, was fire the fire roasted, thing. like, canned thing. Yeah, but what did the live come... What, what's the I live part? <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to a dead fire? I, I that's, don't know it's really hard to cook in a dead fire. That's 2021. That's 2021. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I like yeah. that. Yeah. What do you guys think is the best thing to come from sort of the proliferation of with, with serious teeth and everything else, sort of the online food blog culture? What do you think are some of the best things to have emerged from the access to sort of recipes and techniques and et cetera? That's a good question. I would say, you know, one of the best things and one of the reasons I started Serious Eats was if you're a freelance writer, and I'm sure Kenji can uh, corroborate this opinion, you're dealing with tons of gatekeepers in your life. You know, it's like if you, you, there was before the internet, before blogs, if I wanted to write about uh, Detroit pizza or hamburgers or hot dogs, I had to pitch an editor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether you know it was Ruth Reichel at Gourmet or. Sam Sifton at the New York Times, or whoever it was. And the internet uh, made it a much more democratic process because, you know, for me, for me as a, and I was a reasonably successful freelance writer, it was like an emancipation proclamation, mm -hmm. you know, because I used the standards that I learned in writing for the Times and Gourmet and so I had pretty high journalistic standards, and I learned how to report and write and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. But uh, what the internet did was like, it made the pitch meetings short, like the shortest possible, like, Ed, I want to do a story on fried clams. Great <laughs> idea, Ed. <laughs> Let's do it. For, for me, um, coming from Cook's Illustrated to, to Serious Seats, um, I mean, that, that, that was probably the biggest difference I found is that, um, at Cook's Illustrated as like a print-based magazine that, where that is all subscription supported. Um, they have to make sure that everything in every issue appeals to the broadest possible selection of their readers. Um, and so that involves like tons and tons of number crunching and surveys and seeing like what's up. It's the reason why like every every November there's a brand new turkey recipe, even though not much has changed about <laughs> turkey. Um, but you need that turkey there to sell it. Um, and so to me, the big change was that when you go to an online um, uh, an online audience, um, it doesn't really matter how like eclectic your idea is because you're gonna find like there's there is like a strong niche community that cares a lot about hard boiled eggs, right? It, or like a niche community that cares what, whatever you can think about, what, whatever food you can think about. There's somebody who cares a lot about it, um, and so if you can write, you know, it would never fly in a regular magazine because 90% of the readers might be turned off. Um, but now you're now you're talking about a, a, pop, uh, a possible audience pool of the entire world, um, and there you're going to find people who are interested in. And that was Kenji's very first food lab post. Boil right? Yeah. Was really? how to boil an egg. Oh, let's talk. Does anybody want to ask how do you make a perfect hard boiled egg? <laughs> He's the man. Uh, I'm the woman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the perfect hard. Okay. First of all, okay. what? Describe what the first, with, let's describe the end product. What's okay. the perfect hard boiled egg? Say um, in three words. Okay, oh, yeah, you go first then. Okay. I'll expand on your three okay. words. Perfect hard boiled egg is wet but set. Wet but set. Okay. Top, yeah. th top that. Uh, I'm not going to top it in eloquence, but I would say that it also has to be perfectly peeled. Okay. No, like no divots, okay. no fingernail marks. Um, um, and. Um, yeah, the rest is pretty good. I would say, yeah, you want the yolk at that point where it like just, just, just turned opaque. Yeah. Yeah. So, do we want a green rim? No. A green ring. No. no. Do we want it um, I mean, powdery? You can if you want to. Yeah. Do we want it powdery? No. But how do you do it? 
You tell uh, me okay, first. So first <laughs> okay, so the first is you have to start with boiling water. Okay. And the reason why you... I'm team boiling water. <laughs> the reason why you have Even to start... Even I know that. Well, the reason why you have to start with boiling water is because at that point, you can give the time in which the eggs should cook. So, for oh, instance... I have another reason. <laughs> well, you're probably smarter, but I'm just telling you my reason. <laughs> so, if you don't know how, you know, so let's suppose you have a very low flame. You don't have a, a, a you know, high BTUs, right? As the water's coming up to the boil with your egg in it, your egg is slowly cooking. So you really have no way to determine how long it It depends on it. what burner you're using and what pan yeah, you're using. Yeah, right. And how big your pan, how mm -hmm. big your pan is, and how, how many eggs you you're have, cooking yeah, and, and all that. So you start in boiling water and then you're all on the same page. So you gently put your eggs into uh, the water. Um, and I boil mine for uh, about seven minutes. It's a called a seven minute okay. egg. And it, as soon as it reaches that boil, I uh, turn it off. And I let the, it come to, uh, the water come to room temperature. But because the eggs, the size of eggs do vary, um, after a few minutes, I take an egg out and I uh, crack it, not to open it, just to break the shell. And I feel the egg to make sure uh, it's uh, it's giving just a little. So if it's super soft, I allow it to come completely to room temperature. If it's just a slight give, I immediately nice. then take the eggs out and put them in an ice bath. Mm -hmm. All right, hit it. All right. <laughs> Um, mine, so I start either in boiling water or, um, these days actually I, I, I steam, like I, I just get like an inch of water in the bottom of a pot, uh -huh. put a lid on, um, and you can put, like you don't need a rack or anything, you just put the eggs right in, and they cook basically the same as if you're But you're you saying not in submerged in Not water. submerged, oh, yeah, just wow. like, like an inch, half inch of water at the bottom, because um, it comes to boil faster and, and we're in California, so water <laughs> and stuff. Um, um, and so the reason, the reason I um, start from boiling water or from steam, um, and this was a test we did at Serious Eats, where I had um, a few people in the office, but I remember Daniel peeled uh, like 200 eggs. Daniel Gritzer was Kenji's lieutenant, now the managing yes. culinary director. Yeah. So I cooked eggs a bunch of different ways, um, and then I had Daniel um, and a couple other people each peel um, 200 eggs. Um, <laughs> This is what life was like at Serious Eats World Headquarters. Um, to see what, what factors affect how well, how easily they peel. Um, and the number one, like by far the overriding factor was whether you start in hot water or whether you bring it up from cold. So like when you bring it up from cold, the egg kind of fuses to the mm -hmm. shell and it becomes very difficult to peel. But if you drop it directly into boiling or into steaming, then it's much easier. Um, but otherwise it's basically the same as yours. I, I mean, I, I, I f I'll steam mine for like 10 minutes, mm -hmm. um, and then I just immediately ice bath them, mm -hmm. so I don't do the, the slow ramp down cool. But, but what um, about peeling under cold water? You don't find that a difference? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so letting them, so starting from boiling, um, shocking them in an ice bath also yeah. helps. Yeah. Um, and that actually helps get rid of the, um, the air divot at the bottom, because that's like all expanded gas, so if it's still hot while the white starts to cool, um, it'll cool in that shape. But if you plunge it in an ice bath, um, the gas um, de-expands, whatever. My, my uh, brain fart, but it, it you know the, the divot fills up, so right. your egg comes out right. better shape. So for like deviled eggs or something like that, it would be ice bath. Would be yeah, pretty close. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm just happy you didn't say cold starting cold water. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. uh, I'm cheating a little bit because I've stole this from Ed, but who would be at your last supper? Uh, <laughs> oh, that's no family allowed. They would be here. My this is a special time. sauce question that I ask on my podcast. So uh, when Danny Meyer asked me this last week, uh, I write a lot about in the book about a, um, a, a jazz saxophonist who is actually still with us. He's 92 years old, and I, uh, his name is Jimmy Heath, and I took saxophone lessons with him and life lessons from him. And uh, I ended up managing the Heath brothers, and he's just an extraordinary, creative person and human being. And I hope I'm still creating original stuff when I'm 92. So Jimmy Heath would be there, um, and then probably my two writing heroes, Nora Ephron, the late Nora Ephron, who I had the privilege to spend a little bit of time with and played an extra in Julie and Julia 
And then um, Calvin Trillin is is someone that uh, I've idolized since I read his first book. And then there's this great jazz singer, um, who's also no longer with us, named Betty Carter. Um, and you have to be a pretty hardcore jazz fan. And so those are the people that I think would be at my last supper. Uh, no family allowed, you know, because the reason I put that in is because everyone would say, oh, my wife or my children, and then it's like, we need to get beyond that, so. <laughs> are we going to? Yeah, we are, with you two. Oh. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> I said to Ed, I'm happy to be here, but don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Say this question. That she was the want only to be caveat. So I'm not answering. Because someone asked, she did say that. Did someone ask? Just ask me this on another radio show. Uh, so Kenji, I'm done trying to know. I think uh, I have no some ideas. Um, I mean, I would take. Um, I would take. Do I have to pay extra for a translator? No. All right. I would take Beethoven. Beethoven. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. He's been dead a while. He's been dead a while. <laughs> He's been dead a while. Um, I would take um, uh, George Harrison. Okay. Also been dead a while. Um, you do have a great, one of my favorite Paul McCartney stories all, of all time that you have to tell everyone. Right now, in the middle of my list? Or? Yeah, no, after your list, after your list. <laughs> we can end my, I'm not really sure about the rest of my list. Okay. Uh, one more person, and then you can tell your Paul McCartney story. It's very, sh very short. Man, um, oh, uh, Don Herbert, Mr. Wizard. Mr. Wizard, <laughs> perfect. All right, now I'll tell you a Paul Maybe McCartney Richard story. Um, uh, my Paul McCartney story was that I was um, so I lived in um, Central Harlem for a long time near near the Apollo, and um, there was a day when I was coming back from a trip, um, and on my way home I saw oh, like Paul McCartney playing live tonight on the sign, um, and so. I was like, you know, like, it's just about the time the show's probably going to be getting out. Like, maybe I'll, like, hang out for a bit and see if I can, um, see if I can, get, you know, meet him. Um, and my, so my mother had picked me up from the airport, and I had her drop me off right there. Um, and the only thing I had with me was this um, uh, chocolate, um, um, what's it called, the calendar where you open a door every day? <laughs> yes, an, a, yeah. an <laughs> advent calendar. Um, so anyhow, I was, I was walking around the front, nothing, 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 all the audience came out, and like he never came out, I waited like maybe an extra 15 minutes, and I was like, oh, I forget it, leave. And so my route home took me behind the Apollo, um, and like as I was walking, like I was listening to my music or something, um, and um, yeah, as I was walking, I'd like see these like big lights in front of me, like really big lights, and then like a police barricade, um, and I see there's like a crowd of people behind the police barricade, and I'm like on the other side, because um, I think they had just I guess they didn't see me walking down the street, and they had just pulled in the barricade behind me. Um, and so now, like, I was walking, and then, like, and then, like, I just see like Paul McCartney um, walking, like, um, you know, five feet away from me. And so my first instinct—it was winter. It was, I was wearing a very heavy coat, and my first instinct was to walk up to him and like reach for the sharpie in my <laughs> jacket. Um, and then, like, the next thing I knew, I was tackled, like, on the ground. My shirt was shirt was ripped open. Like, two huge guys on top of me um, asking Paul McCartney. Um, what they should do, and I was just like, I'm, like I was just trying to get an autograph. And they like checked that it was a pen, and then um, and so he he helped me up, um, apologize, um, and then uh, signed my advent calendar. And I asked I asked him, could you make it out to my dad? Could you make it out to Fred? And he's like, how about I'll just leave a, bl a blank space and you can fill it in later. <laughs> we have time for two more questions. This is a quick question. I was excited about the hard boiled eggs. Do you start it? Do you put it in when it's room temperature or straight from the refrigerator into the boiling water? Well, it depends how fresh your eggs are. <laughs> so if you just bought them at the farmer's market, room temperature. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I start mine from the fridge yeah. because my eggs yeah. are oh, usually in the, the fridge. Yeah. 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 Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to, when my daughter needs to eat, I'm not going <laughs> to make her wait an extra half hour. <laughs> So from Slice to all the vegan recipes on the website, uh, do you guys realize how much Serious Eats has changed people's lives? You know, that's a, that's a really great question because thank you yeah. for, for that. Um, a short question. Yeah. You it's know, no I, uh, 
it's not why I started it. And, but the fact that it has changed people's lives through my work and Kenji's work and everybody's work is just an incredibly satisfying thing. You know, that, that we played a role in improving the food lives of millions of people, mm -hmm. you know, which is pretty damn cool. You know, and so, yeah, I, you know, I, it's not something I think about every day, but when I hear it posed as a question at something like this, it really makes me feel great. So thank you. Thank you for that question, because it's really, it, 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 it really is an amazing thing. You know, like something that started as a $100 food blog, you know, just because I didn't want to have any more editors in my life became this thing that millions of people find um, engaging and helpful is, you know, beyond my wildest dreams, so. And our final question. This question is for Nancy. Um, hi, Nancy. Um, I just wanted to clarify that you had talked about um, live fire and we did the dwell panel last year with Mary Sue. You had said that, uh, um, you're, that, that you preferred to cook on open fire with live wood, and, and so did Mary Sue, and that it was your preferred choice of cooking method. So I just wanted to, to clarify that because um, you had brought, brought up the term live fire, and I was just saying that. Well, I it w but it really apologize. Was, it was really. <laughs> no, it, it Maybe was really, it was just peer pressure because I don't think I've ever. I never heard when I started to hear that word. It's like, what is that word, live? But maybe it was just a way of relating to the the crowd. But it really isn't the way that I would write about it. It was fire, you know, fire and wood, wood fire, but not live fire. You need to play me back that tape. I doubt. <laughs> I doubt, I, I may have said wood fire, but I you know, really don't think I said live fire. I, so I just got back from this trip in Colombia, and um, in a lot of, a lot of um, towns in the mountains, um, restaurants will um, indicate whether they're using like charcoal right. or like green, green wood that yeah. creates more smoke, um, which is, I guess, sort of like, maybe, maybe that's live fire because it's still live wood that they're using. I don't know what it can we, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, do you remember our experiments with the, uh, with charcoal fires on the fire escape of the of the, uh, <laughs> the Little Italy loft, and I use the word term loosely, that the serious seats office was in. It's, it's Kenji, so many violations. <laughs> <laughs> we oh, led no. the nation in health department we violations. Had a, we had like a kitchen and, island that was electric, um, but we didn't want we didn't have enough money to put like to bury the cables under. So we just bought this thing from Ikea and then like snaked <laughs> these gigantic cables across the, floor, the middle of the floor of the office. And then um, Kenji, did, um, and Kenji was decided he wanted to do some charcoal grilling. We just used the fire escape because we figured <laughs> yeah, how... That's how, what a fire escape is. Yeah, uh, could that be a problem? And it turned out to be a problem. <laughs> it turned out to be a big problem, but you do what you gotta do. So anyway. <laughs> Well, that brings us to uh, the end of a wonderful evening. Thank you, Kenji, and thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Ed. I'm gonna bring thank Ed you. into the lobby. Thank you all.